Welcome back, ChemStars. You should have already watched the video on naming simple binary ionic compounds, and today we're going to be looking at naming binary ionic compounds using transition metals. Um, it's the same theory as we learned in our previous video, but it's a little bit trickier. So remember, here's our main goal. Whenever we're writing the correct formulas, we want to get the positive and the negative charges to cancel out. So to do that, we can use the simple crisscross method, or if you want to draw it out more visually, we look at how many cations there are times the charge to figure out what the total positive charge is. And then we look at the anion and we see how many negative anions there are times the charge and we get the total negative charge. So we add those up and then they should always equal out to zero. So let's look at some examples. So when we're naming the binary ionic compounds using transition metals, transition metals, that's everything in the D block plus a couple in the lower P block. So make a note right now, that will include Pb, which is lead, and Sn, which is tin. Flip over to your periodic table. So we're talking about all this stuff I have highlighted in, in purple here. So this is the D metal block, the transition metals, plus we're talking about tin and lead over here. I know they're not technically in the D block, but they are transition metals. They have a lot of those P orbitals. Okay, so these, all of these in the D metal block, oops, all of these in the D metal block, they are wishy-washy. That means they can have multiple charges. There are three exceptions though, which I briefly talked about in the other video. We have silver, zinc, and cadmium. So let's go through and figure out why do those always have their certain charges. So let's look at silver first. Silver is right here in the transition block. And if we look at its electron configuration, it would start off the same as krypton. And then we're in the one, two, three, four, the fifth row. So it would be five S two, 4D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So silver's configuration is 5S2, 4D9. Let's write that out and take a look at it. So silver, 5S2, and then 4D9. Back in chapter four, we talked about um, having stable electron configurations. And so if you look at this configuration, we can make it more stable. So silver always makes its configuration 5S1, 4D10. These are the valence electrons. So silver has one valence electron. And it's going to always lose that one valence electron to become a plus one charge. So this is more stable because the d orbital is all the way full and the s orbital is exactly halfway full. So if that's what's happening with silver to make it a one plus charge always, let's take a look at cadmium and zinc. So cadmium and zinc are right here and you can see they end the d block. So it's 4s2, 3d10, and we have 5s2, or 4D10. So let's look at each of those. So zinc we said was 4S2, 3D10. And cadmium's in that same column, in that same family. It's going to be 5S2, 4D10. So let's look at those valence electrons right here. So it has two valence electrons. It has two. So these will always lose the two valence electrons and that will give them that two plus charge and the silver will always lose that one valence and become a one plus so when we're talking about silver zinc and cadmium they never need a roman numeral you just call them silver zinc and cadmium so no roman numerals on these guys you really have to memorize these three things so put a star by it make sure you memorize silver zinc and cadmium so the rest are all wishy-washy, which means that they can form different charges based on different situations. And we need some kind of identification of what that charge is. So we're gonna do this using Roman numerals. Write them down again if you don't remember, but number one, Roman numeral is just one line. Number two, the Roman numeral is two lines. Number three, Roman numeral is three lines. Now I'm gonna skip four for a second. I'm gonna to go to five. Five is a V, so Roman numeral V is five. And when we write four, as we say, it's one less than five. So we say IV. With that line written in front of the five, it means one less than five, which is four. So here's how we're gonna go and find the formula from the name. This part is, is pretty easy, thankfully. The name will have the Roman numerals to give it the charge of the transition metal. So if you're told iron three chloride, this is so nice. Iron three, they're telling you iron formed a three plus charge. Now you have to do a little bit of work on chloride. So you go back, you check the periodic table, chlorine's right here, it's in column 17, it's always gonna be a one minus charge. So we know that chloride's gonna be that one minus. When you're looking at this, does the positive and negative charge cancel out? No, so we know we've got to get 
we've got a three plus, we've got to get a three minus. So how can I get a three minus here? If I have three chlorines, so that means my formula will be Fe, I just need one of them, and then Cl3. Now I wrote it this way so you can kind of see the crisscross. Iron's charge becomes the number of chlorine that I need, and then chlorine's charge becomes the number of iron that I need. I only need one iron and three chlorine. And we don't write the one, so our final formula, we would just say it's FeCl3 for iron three chloride. Let's try two more examples like this on this page. So copper one oxide, copper one. So it must be copper with a one plus. Now we've got to figure out oxides. So you go to the periodic table, oxygens in column 16 is always going to be a two minus charge. So we know that oxygen is two minus. So our quick cheat is do a crisscross. So the one becomes the number of oxygen and the two becomes the number of copper that we need. So copper one oxide, the formula will be Cu2O. If you want to double check it, we can actually draw a little picture here. So we have two coppers and each copper is a one plus. We've got two coppers, each copper is a one plus. So on this side, I've got positive two. And we've got one oxygen. Each oxygen is a two minus. So I've got a two minus. So two plus and two minus, what does that get? That gets zero. The charge is canceled out. And let's look down at our last example on this page. We've got nickel two nitride. So nickel two, they're telling you that nickel's charge is going to be a two plus. And then nitride, we've got to look that up on the periodic table. So find nitrogen. It's in column 15. It needs to gain three electrons to become like a noble gas. So it will always be a three minus charge. So nitride will be N3 minus. So when you look at this, remember, quick cheat, crisscross. So I'm going to need two. I'm going to need three. So it means I need three nickel and I need two nitrogen. That looks a little sloppy. Let's write that nice. So nickel, we need three of those, and we need two nitrogen. This goes back to kind of your least common multiple um, LCM stuff from math class. So if I've got a two plus and a three minus, I need to figure out what positive and what negative number I need that will cancel out. Looking at two and three, the smallest number, they both go into a six. So I need to have a plus six and a minus six. Did I get that? So two plus, two plus, two plus for the nickel side, that gives me a six plus, that's good. And then I've got a three minus and I've got two nitrogen, so I've got another three minus, that gives me a minus six. A plus six and minus six, that comes out to zero. So I have no net charge. I've properly crisscrossed and gotten the formula for this. Okay, let's flip the page. Now that's easy going from the name of the formula. We have to do a little bit more work um, to find um, it going in the opposite direction. So to find the name from the formula, we need to figure out the charge of the cation. It's the same process, just in reverse. So here's how you start. Always look at your anion first because they never change. They're never wishy-washy. So we need to have um, that in our mind when we go through and try and figure this out. So if we look at an example, PBO, I'm like, oh, lead, that's because there's a metal, might have a funny charge. Oxygen, oxygen I know is charge. Oxygen will always be a two minus. So right off the bat, I know that oxygen is always two minus. If we did a crisscross, you think there should be a two here, but there's not. That means I must have reduced my charge. So just looking at it, there should be a two here. It's not written. Well, that means that lead's charge was probably two. And when we crisscrossed it, we would have got PB2O2. Let's go through and look at that a little bit more in depth. So here's how we can solve it algebraically. So we look at the cation, how many? So how many leads are there? There's one lead. And we don't know lead's charge. It's a question mark right now. Look at the anion. How many and the charge? So the anion is oxygen. The cation is lead. We know that there is one oxygen and its charge is negative two. They have to always equal out to zero. Then we just solve for the question mark. So one times question mark is question mark. One times negative two is negative two. So isolate and solve that. That means question mark equals positive two. Therefore, the name is lead two oxide. Let's go back up and look at that. So if I've got Pb2 plus and O2 minus, if we try and figure out the formula, they exactly cancel each other out. So I need one of each. The formula for that would be PbO. Okay, let's try another one together. So iron and oxygen. So let's kind of write out what we know. We know that there are, for iron, there are two irons and we do not know the charge. 
And we know that there are three oxygen and oxygen's charge is always a two minus. So remember, oxygen's always gonna be a two minus. And that whole thing has to equal out to zero. So we've got two question mark plus three times two is negative six and that has to equal zero. So let's isolate and solve that. That means that two question mark has to equal six. So I'm gonna divide each side by two and that means that my question mark must equal three. So the name for this is going to have to be iron three oxide. But let's do a double check before we, we get that done. So it's over here in our blank space. If it's iron three, we're right now we're thinking it's iron three oxide. The formula they were given is Fe2O3. Let's just double check that. So if it's iron three, we've got Fe3 plus. We've got two of them, so it's Fe3 plus. And then we've got three oxygen. O2 minus, O2 minus, O2 minus. So on this side, I've got two minus, two minus, two minus, that's a negative six. And I've got three plus, three plus, three plus, that's a positive six. Do those count kids out? Yes. That means that the correct name for this one is iron three oxide. Okay, so I've shown you the rules. I want you to pause the video and then try these next three problems on your own. If you get stuck or confused, look back up to the examples and try sketching out to see how the ions are going to cancel each other. Okay, thanks for pausing. If you didn't pause the video, I'm stopping and giving you a little hint right now. I'm giving you the charge on each of the ions listed. So if you didn't pause, actually pause it now and go through and try these on your own. Okay, pause it, name them, and write the formulas. Okay, so let's go over your answers. So let's start over here. This side's kind of the easier side. 10 for nitride. So the name 10 for tells you that 10's charge is 4. Nitrogen, you go to the periodic table and you see that its charge is 3 minus. The simple trick we showed you is the crisscross. So nitrogen's charge becomes the number of 10, and then 10's charge becomes the number of nitrogen. You can do a double check. If I have four ten or three tens and its charge is four plus, that gives me a positive twelve. Positive twelve. If I have four nitrogen and nitrogen's charge is three minus, that gives me a negative twelve. Positive twelve and negative twelve, those will cancel out. Look at the next one. We've got cobalt two, so cobalt's cobalt's charge is two, and I'm going to need two chlorines. Chlorine's charge is negative one. I need one cobalt. Remember, we don't write that one. And so, do your double check. Cobalt, 2 plus times 1 is going to be a 2 plus. Chlorine's a 1 minus. There's two chlorines. It's going to be a 2 minus. Do my charges cancel? Yes. And let's try one more. Now, silver was tricky. You have to remember that silver is one of those always 1 plus ions. So I'm going to need 1 oxygen. We don't write the 1. Oxide's always a 2 minus. Oops, I should have written that up higher. Oh, boy. Pretend I did that right the first time. So you got to make sure that we're writing the superscripts correctly. So we always going to put the two minus up top there. So oxide is two minus, and then that will give me two silver. And then we check and make sure those charges canceled. So silver is one plus, there's two of them, two plus. Oxygen is a, a two minus, there's one of them, that's a two minus, so two plus and two minus comes out to zero. That was the easier stuff. Let's look over at the trickier part. You might have struggled with this side. So remember, you always, always, always want to start with the anion and what you know. So we know that oxygen is always going to be a two minus, and there's two of them. So what is the charge on the negative part of this um, ionic compound? We've got a four minus right here. That means that this part has to be a four plus. So there's only one manganese, that makes it manganese four. On my next one, we want to, again, focus on the anion. Sulfur is always a two minus. There's just one sulfur, so it's two minus on this side. That means that this part, the cation, has to be a two plus. There's only one chromium, it's gotta be chromium two. And then we've got one more, bromine. Bromine's charge is always a one minus, but there's two bromine, so the anion charge here is two minus. That means the cation total charge has to be a two plus. There's only one gold, so it's gonna be gold um, two, and that's bromide. Um, what if we had like two gold or three or four gold here? If that was the case, we'd have to split that charge up over it. So if it was like, um, multiple metals, we'd have to make sure we distribute that total charge over them, just like we did up here in the algebra. So to sum up, 
you can figure these out by doing a short algebra problem, by drawing a picture, or just kind of making some notes about what the net charges have to be. Our one rule is we got to add up to zero.